Stanford University. Hello, everyone. Hey, oh, thank you. So, uh, my name is Yuri Leskowitz. I'm a faculty here at um, Computer Science. I welcome everyone to the um, computer Science Department uh, Distinguished uh, Lecture Series. Uh, today I'm very happy to have um, John Kleinberg uh, from Cornell uh, among us. So uh, John has obtained his PhD uh, at uh, MIT uh, 14, 15 years ago and he has been on uh, faculty in Computer Science Department at Cornell ever since. Um, John's research focuses on web and uh, social and information networks. He has been working on topics uh, related to the web and um, information since early days of the web. He's probably the most well known for uh, the hubs and authorities algorithm and the decentralized search on networks that led to interesting uh, applications in peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, currently, John is working on understanding how people uh, evaluate other people and items uh, on the web and um, how can this feel, feed into a recommender system. Um, I first met John I think it was in summer 2003 when I was still an undergrad that um, this was at the KDD conference and then um, had a chance to work with him uh, when he was on sabbatical at CMU. Um, so please, um, let's welcome John. Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, thanks very much for the invitation to, 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 to come speak here. It's always a, really a great pleasure to, to, to be able to come, come, come to the Stanford. And uh, I've really enjoyed getting to talk to a whole bunch of you during, during the day today, hearing lots of interesting stuff. Um, okay, so what I wanted to, um, and thanks, thanks Yurei for the introduction. Um, actually, I, right, I first met Yurei when uh, Johannes Gerke and Paul Ginsberg and I were giving out awards for the 2003 KDD Cup competition. And actually, uh, second place that year was a, a team from a, a large statistical consulting firm. Um, not important which one. And since they'd come in second, they asked if they could you know, issue a press release and have be on hand to answer me a question so they come in second. First place went to a single undergrad from Slovenia, you're right, so. Um, <laughs> anyway, so. Okay, so what I want to talk about today was some issues in thinking about social phenomena online and on the web and some of the interplay of large scale computational models and data together with um, some classical theories from the social sciences and, and, and how these interact. So obviously part of this in introduction I, I don't really need to convince you of, especially here, that obviously you know, one development over the past really 15 years is that our technological networks have become intertwined with our social networks, right? And that to the extent that it's really, it's really hard to separate the two out anymore. And that's really caused this enormous broadening of the design problem for information systems, right? Where we once had to worry about sort of the computational and technological constraints, th those are all present compounded by the complexity of social feedback effects when you have a very large audience that is interacting on a network, right? And that brings in social issues. It also brings in uh, issues of incentives and economic principles. All of these are very interesting questions. And if we're going to understand that design space, um, part of what we're going to need to understand is how these social feedback loops operate. And that, I think, is really a, a fascinating question that lies at the interface of computer science and the social sciences. And I, I think it really starts with this premise that in lots of areas of science, science advances when we take things that were once invisible and make them visible, right? And it's sort of been an irony for a long time that in the physical sciences, our powers of measurement have somehow exceeded our powers of measurement in the social sciences, right? And it, it's meant, for example, that for a long time we've understood more about, you know, exploding stars at the edge of the galaxy or the fine structure of the yeast genome than we have about how people interact in social groups, despite the fact that people interacting in social groups is what we experience every day and exploding stars at the edge of the galaxy is something remote and inaccessible to us. It's been the strange inversion, and that inversion has happened not because humans in social groups has not been important or has not been scientific questions, but because of differences in measuring ability. And that's one thing that's changing at this point. Because the ability of us to look at digital traces online and the increasing sense in which digital social interaction comes to resemble our real lives offline, such that it tells us things about our real lives offline, means that we, we, we get this interface between computer science and the social sciences, where we can take algorithms to try taking these digital traces and looking at traces of human behavior, um, extending models that have really been in the social sciences for a long time, and potentially posing new questions and generating new theories. Okay. And that's a feedback loop which I think is very exciting. Um, it's going to lead to all sorts of changes, I think, in 
both fields, right? It's going to lead to changes in computer science as we think about this new design space in the social sciences as they increasingly become data intensive using these kinds of data sets. Okay, so in order to set some context for how did I end up getting here and becoming interested in asking these questions, I actually wanted to start just by sort of an example of how this, how this process works. I mean, this is all kind of abstract, these two fields coming together. Um, let me make it a little concrete by actually harking back to a bit of what's now sort of really old history, and actually a talk I gave, as far as I can remember, in this room, not, not, not my, not, you know, sort of three or four visits to Stanford back, um, now close to maybe 10 years ago, talking about small world networks and the six degrees of separation, okay? And so th this is just sort of two slides of back history to sort of su suggest, you know, what's the kind of aesthetic when one looks at in this. So the six degrees of separation has been much talked about. Uh, this idea that we're all six steps apart in the social network of the United States or the world or, you know, some suitable definition of a large social network. And the number six goes back to this experiment of Stanley Milgram, which is sort of how I began my talk ten years ago. Right, what Stanley Milgram wanted to know was, are there really these short paths connecting all of us in society? And so what he did was he chose a target person in Boston, in a suburb of Boston, Sharon, Massachusetts, who, who, who he knew. He picked a lot of random starting people in Nebraska. That was sort of far enough away to make this a a challenging test for them. He gave each one a letter and said, I'd like you to deliver this to this target person. We're testing whether there really are these short paths. And you have to pass it to someone you know on a first name basis with these instructions to get there, right? Nowadays, we would, of course, ask this question totally differently. We'd look at a big data set, a big phone call network, or a big, you know, part of the, some other graph, and we would just try to compute things by breadth first search. But Stanley Milgram didn't have massive data sets. He didn't actually have he wasn't using computers. He had a budget for this experiment of $680. And so he sent out <laughs> letters. And as a result, he was forced to embark on a much more interesting version of the experiment, where he essentially was asking people to take part in a massive, collaborative, distributed routing experiment. You had to guess which of your friends was going to be most likely to lead you on a path to the target. And so looking at this as a computer scientist, when you come across this experiment, say, three decades later in 2000, you're naturally led to the algorithmic question, right? How, why did distributed routing succeed? And as it happened, when I was first thinking about this in 2000, 1999 and 2000, um, I had ready at hand a very natural network model that my colleagues at Cornell, Duncan Watts, and Steve Strogatz had just proposed in an uh, influential paper in Nature in 1998, right? And they had suggested that one way to think about how large social networks work and how distributed routing might work in these in particular is to imagine that we all live on a grid representing geography Right? That's, of course, a world that we all know. It's very structured, but it's a big world. It takes many steps to get from the upper left in Seattle to the lower right in Key West. But we also add to that these long-range random red links that you see there. And that's what makes the world small. Right? I don't know where your long-range links all land, but I know where my long-range links land. Right? And that's the unknown part. Right? The world is small because of things we don't all know. Okay. And so what I thought about was this, was this routing problem. And you know, to sort of make a long story short, one can analyze this model in which the long-range links are put in with a particular kind of distribution, right? Not all long-range links are equally likely. Rather, your long-range links, the probability that you link to someone at a distance d away falls off like 1 over d to the alpha. Right? So think like an inverse linear law or an inverse square law, right? Sort of like physical forces decay, so does linking probability in this model, right? Very, very simple model. And what you could prove is that when alpha was too small, the network was too random. There was too much that you didn't know, and you couldn't efficiently find the paths that were there. And when alpha was very big, the network was more controllable, but on the other hand, there weren't a lot of short paths, and so that too was not good. And there was an optimum in between, in particular when alpha was equal to 2, where search was most efficient. When linking happened with an inverse square law, the, the short paths were there, but also they were sort of controllable. You, you, you could find them. And in fact, there was sort of a discontinuity at 2. 2 was special. It was singular. Okay. So th this made for sort of a nice story, starting with the Milgram experiment, which of course was, was very appealing and back then even not as well known to people as it is now, ending with this sort of nice mathematical model. On the other hand, at the time, I was sort of struck by the fact that it was making an awfully specific prediction about the world. It said, you know, if you really believe in the Milgram experiment and you really believe in this model as a representation of reality, then you should inevitably believe that this is the right exponent for actually getting search to work quickly. And I wasn't really sure whether I actually meant this to be a prediction about the world. It was a consequence of the model. It was a theorem. But I, you know, at the time, I did not say it was a prediction. I simply said, you know, it doesn't really matter if 2 is the real exponent or if, you know, if this is exactly the right model. The point is, you know, qualitatively, we've learned that there's, you know, too random and there's not random enough and there's some in-between thing and who, who, who knows how, you know, if this is really the real model, right? 
still, I had the sense that I was sort of on the hook for a prediction about the world. Right? And, um, but I, at the same time, I also felt like, okay, in the year 2000, you know, even with the web, and even with all the data we had on the web and all the web crawls that everyone was collecting, I mean, how are you ever really going to test this? I mean, after all, you were going to have to create a site where you could convince millions of people to all go online and say where they lived and who their friends were, right? <laughs> when was that ever going to happen? Okay, so that problem got solved faster than any of us would have, would have expected. And so a few years later, um, people actually began to uh, look at the actual measurements you could make based on geographic distance. And so actually the first uh, paper to do this was this third one here. So a bunch of us generalized this to other notions of distance. But it was actually my former student, David Libanel, working with Ravi Kumar, Prabhakar Raghavan, and Andrew Tompkins, who actually had the idea to actually take social network data, which in 2005 was LiveJournal with about a million people, zip codes, friendships, and actually try to fit this exponent. Now I should mention, in up here at the top of the slide, to, to fit the exponent, the big problem is that the population density of the U.S., they had U.S. data, is very non-uniform. So of all the things that, you know, there are lots of ways which this does not resemble reality. But the hardest one to generalize, we can gloss over the rest, they're, they're easy to take care of. The hard one is the uniform density assumption. And so what they did was they had a different notion of distance where they said, okay, let's not think about physical distance. Let's think about every person sorts the whole world by their distance from them. Okay? So I'll say the rank of W with respect to V is the number of nodes that are closer to V than W is. Okay, so I sort everyone, and the person at rank 100 means that there are, you know, 100 people closer, including myself. Right. So on a circle of radius D, uh, there are D squared people inside. So if you're at distance D in a uniform density point set, you're at rank D squared. Right. So D squared becomes rank R. And therefore, if you want to think about what does 1 over d squared mean in this more general version, it's really node v connects to w probably 1 over rank. Because 1 over rank is like 1 over d squared in this more general setting, thanks to that little calculation. Okay, that you can now go and look at data. Because now we can take any population density, including the density of the U.S. LiveJournal, it was cleanest to do it on the coast separately, because there wasn't that much coverage. And what they found was actually that there was actually a remarkably close agreement with the exponent of 1. On LiveJournal, it was 1 over rank to the 1.05. And much more recently, um, Lars Backstrom and colleagues at Facebook, as part of actually a much larger study they were doing on the role of geography and friendships, noticed that sort of with the infrastructure they had, they could easily replicate this on the Facebook data. And you get one of a rank to the 0 0.95. Again, extremely, extremely close to one in some sense, right? Given that that exponent could have been anything at all. So this sort of, you know, comes full circle in a sense. And it makes you feel like, you know, it's actually possible to sort of make predictions here look at the data and actually have them be borne out more than you might have even expected given the, 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 the simplicity of the models. And so a couple things. First, it's, it's, it sort of raises open questions of its own, which I won't try to cover here, and which are actually largely open. Namely, why is the world actually converging to this optimum for search if you, if you believe in these models? Clearly, whatever people are doing on Facebook, they're not trying to run copies of the Milgram experiment. That's not what it's there for. And yet, the social links have evolved, and perhaps in the offline world they've evolved that way too, so as to either accidentally or not make it optimal for a decentralized search. Why is that happening? Is there some actual process going on, some selective pressure making that happen? Is it some accidental convergent evolution in which the network's trying to do something else and it happens to be also optimizing for that? Completely unclear. And actually, a lot of interesting theories going on as to what are the forces that might cause this, cause this to happen. And there are certainly some, some social things. We may not be running the Milgram experiment, but we are often trying to find a lead to somebody who knows something about some topic we're learning about. We're trying to sublet an apartment via a friend of a friend. We get a job referral through a friend of a friend. We're doing social transactions that look somewhat Milgram-like, chasing down paths. And if in the process we rewire our social links to make it look like that, it's been argued that that actually does help converge the network towards us. Okay, interesting questions. But as context for the talk, this was sort of the feedback loop between experiments, you know, sort of classic experiments and theories in the social sciences, mathematical and computational models, and eventually looking at data to, to, to see what's going on. And when these results came out, actually a bunch of us at Cornell sat down, particularly Michael Macy, who at the time was the chair of the sociology department, Dan Hottenlocker and myself. And, you know, and especially Michael was particularly passionate as a career sociologist saying, you know, there's really a chance to take some of the great sociological conundrums of the 20th century and try to really sharply pose the question mathematically such that we could ask it on the kind of data that's becoming available. It's, it's really a way to try doing 
research at, at this interface. And so over the past couple of years, we've been asking some of these questions, you know, we and, and other people. And it's, it's really about very basic questions about collective human behavior. And so I want to list a couple of them and then sort of dig into one of them to sort of show you what's been going on there. Right, so kinds of questions of the form like, what's the effect of peer influence, right? What's the probability you engage in some new activity based on what your friends are doing, right? And a number of us have been looking at those kinds of questions. And actually, even recently, validating notions that, you know, with behavior that's risky or controversial, you actually need more exposures in order to adopt something. And you even see that in, in the online world. Um, other questions that are very interesting, including why are you similar to your friends, right? So, right, so this, this idea that you adopt similar behaviors to your friends, you know, there's a simplistic notion that that's because they influence you, right? And a lot of the language in the online world is about social influence and the way people influence each other. But really, there are a sort of multiplexity of reasons why you might be similar to your friends. Maybe it's because, yes, they influence you. Um, but maybe it's because you never actually change your mind about anything. You simply seek out people who are already like you, and that's why your friends are similar to you. Right? Both of those would lead to the same observed snapshot of the network in which friends are similar. But they're arising for completely different reasons. Right? In order to resolve that, you actually need some kind of time-resolved activity in which you can actually see these things changing over, over time. And that's, again, work. Data from the online domain has allowed us to do that, to look how similarity changes both before and after social links are formed. Okay, and a third big topic, which is the subject of some ongoing work, which I'll be talking about for most of the rest of the talk, is this question of ev ev evaluation, right? So there are many, many contexts in our lives, online and offline, where we're called upon to evaluate other people or the work that other people produce or the things other people do, right? Those evaluations are positive or negative. And trying to understand what is it, what are the forces that drive those, 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 those kinds of evaluations, okay? Right, both positive and negative. So let me give you some examples. Um, so let's talk about the online domain. At the end, I'll circle back to some offline questions, okay? So there are, online, there are lots of situations where one person expresses an opinion about another or about another's content that they've put online, right? So, and these have different semantics, which I've written in these sort of simple declarative sentences, right? So for example, you could be saying, when you express approval or disapproval, I trust you, right? So what might be trust that you mean when you evaluate someone? Um, as for example, right, exposed in this very influential paper uh, from here on, on the eigentrust algorithm, right? Um, so ePinions, for example, is a, is a case where you have an explicit trust network where we get data on how people express at least what they intend to mean trust. Um, you could be saying, I agree with you, which I'll argue shortly might be a different thing from trust, right? I agree with your opinion. Um, you could say, we're all in an online community and you're a new person trying to get into this community and there's some inner circle and I vote in favor or against admitting you into the community, right? Is that the same as trust? Is it the same as agreeing? Not clear, right? Um, you could say something like, I like your content, or I find your answer helpful, I find your opinion helpful, right? So think on Amazon, was this review helpful to you? Um, think in the offline world, was this recommendation letter convincing to you? Right, these kinds of questions, what do you think of this person's opinion? Right? So lots and lots of things, right? E opinions, argue about trust, uh, the blog is, right, Wikipedia, where there's a lot of voting to the people in the community. Actually, Wikipedia is an interesting one, right? So on Wikipedia, which I'll be coming back to, there are sort of a circle of 2,000 sysadmins on Wikipedia who have the ability to lock down articles, resolve controversy, and, 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 and so forth, um, resolve disputes. And in order to be admitted to that august group who really runs a lot of stuff, you actually have to have a fair amount of investment in the system, and you actually have to apply, right? So it's almost like a little tenure and promotion case. You'll actually notice that the, all my analogies are littered with academic references because it's the world I live in, I can't escape it. But it's almost like a tenure promotion case where you submit your Wikipedia CV, all the things you've done in the community, and there's a public vote and a public discussion, right? Which means when you vote for or against somebody, that's a vote that's public, recorded, and consequential, right? And so it certainly says something about your relation to that person, right? I agree with you. I, I had an icon for opinions on Wikipedia. The blogosphere, there's no icon, but I've decided to appropriate this uh, adamaging glance. A uh, picture of the hopelessly polarized political blogosphere before the 2004 election as the kind of <laughs> icon for it. Um, and that's about, you know, agreement or disagreement, arguably. Okay. Part of the point here, and this gets back to the question of design space, you give someone a button that says, you know, are you for or against this person or their content, and they press the button. The problem is we don't really know what they meant when they pressed the button. Were they saying, I trusted them, I agreed with them, I was somehow, I was impressed by their credentials, I found them helpful? We don't know, right? All they did was they pressed a button. And so I think part of the challenge here is actually to extract out of the aggregate behavior some interpretations, right? And I'm going to argue next that different interpretations leave different structural signatures on the network. And so if we can go into the network and look at those signatures, we might be able to infer what was being meant in aggregate 
by what's happening. Okay, and again, natural analogies to offline domains, which I'll actually come, come back to, right? And so this question of like, you know, I accepted your paper into a conference, I hired you for an academic job, we'll come back to that. Okay, so that's the question. How can we tell what purpose an evaluation is serving in a given context? And so I, I want to walk through a couple things quickly to sort of mainly give a sense of how we might build up a vocabulary for talking about this, right? Here it seems kind of daunting. I just put down these informal English words. How are we going to get from here to there? How are we going to actually make something precise? So I wanted to start by arguing that we can start to make it precise by looking back to theories from social network analysis as to what structural signatures different kinds of evaluations leave on the network. Okay? And the two theories I'll talk about uh, are the theory of structural balance, which dates back to the work of Heider in the 1940s, and a theory of status, which sort of has appeared in different guises, both in the sociology literature and also more recently in the computer science literature. Okay, then once we have some structural signatures, we can actually go and look at online data and say, you know, can we see evidence of one or the other of these things happening? Um, and then finally, I'll circle back to the offline world and talk about um, how some of this might help us in thinking about uh, e even ongoing discussions people have about the structure of science and how credit is awarded in science. Okay. All right, so that's, that's the overall plan. And again, you know, some of these I'll go through somewhat quickly to give you sort of an overview of the kind of vocabulary we use again when, when, we, when we talk about this. Okay, so what is the theory of structural balance? This is sort of the oldest theory of positive and negative evaluation. And it was really an attempt by the social psychologist Fritz Heider to formalize the kind of logic that we see in friend-enemy relations. And in particular, these kinds of proverbs. The friend of my friend is my friend. The enemy of my friend is my enemy. I won't read them all to you. You can see them. Um, not wanting to get into the numerology of proverbs too much, but you'll notice that uh, you know, there are three slots here that can take the word friend or enemy and uh, two cubed is eight. So there are eight proverbs I could have written down, but only four of them actually make sense. You can try out the other four, they make no sense. Um, and the four that make sense are the ones that have an odd number of occurrences of the word friend. Okay. Um, that's not accidental. And the reason it's not accidental is we can think about this graph theoretically. Okay. So let's say a triangle on three people, because after all, these really refer to sets of three people. We'll say it's balanced if it's sort of psychologically, in Heider's language, plausible, if there's no internal stress in the system. And it's unbalanced if there's some source of internal stress. Okay, so let's walk through these and just sort of use our intuition about this. Uh, three mutual friends, nothing wrong with that. Balanced, okay. Um, similarly, let's jump to here. Uh, a triangle with one plus and two minuses, A and B are mutual friends, they have a common enemy. Again, no obvious source of latent stress that needs to be resolved. Things get trickier when you look at the other two. Right? A is friends here, A is pluses to B and C, B and C are enemies, because right? we're using this friend-enemy language. Uh, that means A has, friend, A has friends with two people who don't get along. Right? So there's something that has to be worked out here. Maybe A will convince B and C to reconcile and we'll end up with this, or maybe one of them will convince A to team up with them against the other one and we'll end up with that. <coughs> Finally, three mutual enemies. Trickier. Uh, not clear what we learned from three mutual enemies. And in fact, the field of structural balance bifurcates here as to whether you view that as unbalanced or balanced. Um, Let's make the argument for why it's unbalanced. In situations where there's sort of large amounts of stress, where it's really important to choose sides, um, you could argue that uh, in this situation, the two people who dislike each other the least will team up against the third. Example, situations with lots of stress, high stakes. Uh, if, for those of you who can think back this far, the contentious end of the 2008 Democratic primary season, <laughs> three people, Obama, McCain, and Clinton, all of whom arguably did not get along with each other at that particular moment. But it was clear that you know, the high likelihood was two of them were going to team up against the other one uh, rather than leave this as a sort of three mutual enemy situ situation. But again, things differ depending on what context you're looking at. There are other contexts where you say, you know, it's a big world out there and just because I don't really get along with my neighbor and I also don't get along with you know, this person who works at the store doesn't mean that secretly they're friends and they're teaming up against me. Right? <laughs> Different situations. Okay, but let's think about this logic here. Um, and let's think about it in these sort of small high stakes situations because there's actually some interesting mathematics that one can do on this. It turns out that this, as phrased, is a theory of consistency. I would like consistency in my relationships. And one way to summarize it is to say, I'm going to be friends with someone when, when we can agree on our relations with third parties. If we tend to like the same people and dislike the same people, that promotes our friendship. And if we disagree how we feel about third parties, that hurts our friendship, makes us more enemies. That's what this is. That's a theory about how, we, how you and I maintain consistency. But it turns out globally, and somehow mathematically equivalently, balance theory is also a theory of polarization. And that's thanks to the following theorem of Cartwright and Harari from the 50s. Um, and it says the following. 
If I tell you, if I have a complete graph, okay, so for the next two slides, let's talk about complete graphs where everyone knows everyone, which is again more admissible, more appropriate for small groups where it's reasonable people have opinions on each other, everybody. Um, if I tell you that all triangles in a signed complete graph are balanced, I give you an end node graph, every pair of nodes is connected, and every triangle, all n choose three triangles, look like this or look like that, okay? Um, can I tell you, can we decide something about what the graph must look like, okay? And they prove a very strong theorem. Then, if this holds, the nodes can always be partitioned into two sets of mutual friends, x and y, um, such that there are complete friendships in here and there's complete enemy relations between them. The only way to maintain perfect structural balance is through two polarized camps. Clearly this is balanced, right? I mean, any triangle here lives either entirely in, on one side, and then it's three friends, or it lives with two legs on one here and one here, and then it's two friends with a mutual enemy. So clearly those are balanced, these structures. The hard part, which is actually not so hard to prove if you go try it at home afterwards, is that this is the only way to achieve balance. So structural balance, which was masquerading in Heider's work as a theory of consistency in our friendships, was equally well a theory of polarization. Okay. Right? It's a thing about local constraints implying global structure. Yeah? Did you say that three mutual enemies is also balanced? Then the extreme cases are uh, uh, sort of uh, multiple camps. Uh, Unions of arbitrary numbers. <coughs> <orders. coughs> yeah. And so actually, you even have <coughs> structures there, right? So there's some work by Davis in the 60s um, right, that said, if I say only this is not balanced, then you still get a strong structure theorem. But it says I replace this with an arbitrary number of cliques of pluses. Yep, exactly. And you, and you can actually take a lot of what I'm about to say and do it in that context also. Yeah. OK. So but one thing that had been left open, and which I'll spend one slide talking about, is there are some intriguing questions about the dynamic version of the story. Right? So in a lot of social science models, in fact, uh, you see this with Nash equilibria in economics, for example, in a lot of cases. You, you have things which are equilibria without a dynamics to get there, right? This says a balanced structure is one where there is no stress in any triangle. And I motivate it with a kind of dynamic story. I said things like, well, if your two friends don't get along, you'll get them to reconcile, or you'll team up with one. That's a nice story. But in the end, the analysis was only about the end point of that, if we happen to already be balanced. How do we get to balance, right? Does the story about reconciliation and consistency actually get us to balance? That turned out to be remarkably hard to do. And actually, this question was sort of posed sharply only much after uh, the uh, creation of structural balance theory by th three, three, three physicists, Antal, Kropivsky, and Redner, who asked, can you describe a plausible di dynamics that evolves an arbitrary set of pluses and minuses into a state that's structurally balanced, presumably by using local rules in which we update our friendships? Okay. Um, and there are a number of interesting open questions here and some partial results. I wanted to mention a, a, a couple here because I think there are a number of intriguing questions. Um, things differ depending on whether you're going to talk about a discrete dynamics or a continuous dynamics for this. Okay. So what's a discrete dynamics? In discrete dynamics, I choose some edge AB and I say we should update how we feel about each other. Right? We should decide if we're friends or enemies. And we're going to do that by trying to maintain as much consistency with respect to the rest of the world as possible. Because right? what's structural balance? It's a theory of maintaining consistency. So we're going to look at all the third parties and we're going to say, we agree how we feel about W, we agree on how we feel about X, we disagree, we agree on Y, we both hate them, and we disagree on Z. So three of the triads would be balanced if we were friends, and only one would be balanced if we were not friends. So let's be friends. Right? So this is actually kind of an energy minimization thing. Right? If you view the lack of balance as a kind of energy we're trying to reduce in the system, we're going to pick the sign that reduces energy. There's actually something to watch for here, which is, Choosing signs to reduce energy over structures, of course, is like what one sees in physics models of spin systems, right? The Ising model, uh, the Hopfield model, and so forth. But I should note an important difference, which actually changes things a lot, which is in all those, the spins are on the nodes. Nodes are deciding if they're pluses or minuses, right? This is what physicists call a gauge theory, which is the signs are on the edges, right? It's the edges that are flipping in response to these consistency constraints. And that changes a whole bunch of stuff, actually. Um, I mean, you could look at a world where nodes are edges, but then you're not on a complete graph, you're on some weird graph that's, you know, anyway. Okay, so discrete dynamics didn't actually get very far, and a, a bunch of us worked on this, because the system, in fact, gets trapped in lots and lots of local minima, some that are actually really bizarre looking. And so it turns out not to be such a great story for how the system might find balance. It turns out a much more reasonable dynamics, if you try and reach balance, was actually proposed by um, actually three other physicists, Kulikovsky um, and his co-authors in, in a sequence of papers. And their model is also about this picture and about how we're going to enforce consistency, but it relaxes the system to have real number values on the edges. 
Okay. So now how i and j feel about each other is going to be a real number xij, positive or negative. Okay. And that's going to evolve in continuous time according to the following differential equation. Okay. Here's xij. To decide how i and j feel about each other, they're going to look at their relations to third parties. Let's look at a third party k. Well, the product xik xkj, which is the product of the signs on those, the product of those two edges, is positive if they have the same sign and negative if they have the opposite sign. Right? So when they have the same sign, that kind of promotes friendship. And when they have opposite signs, it hurts friendship. So the derivative of xij with respect to time should be negative when the sign is negative and positive when it's positive. So very simple dynamics are just sum over all third parties which direction they're pushing us in and by how much. And we get this system of differential equations on n choose two variables. Okay. All right. So in simulation, so that they had a bunch of simulations. They simulated different flavors of this. And the thing always seemed to actually unkink itself into two polarized camps. And it was sort of intriguing why is that happening. And so actually in some very recent work that Bobby Kleinberg, Seth Marvel, and Steve Strogatz and I have done, we can actually analyze the system um, and show that actually for generic initial conditions, meaning essentially with probably one if I set random initial conditions, um, the system actually converges in finite time indeed to structural balance. Okay. So this is a system you actually have to normalize because these entries want to blow up and rapidly. Okay. Um, but if you kind of keep some normalization going, what actually happens is that the xij's are converging to a much simpler structure. They're converging to something where there are numbers yi on the nodes and xij is simply the product of yi and yj. Okay. So all these xij's are evolving and in the end they're explained very simply. We each have a number. Think of where we are, the number is sort of where we are in some political ideological spectrum. And how we feel about each other is just the product. So everyone to the right of zero likes each other and everyone to the left of zero likes each other and everyone on opposite sides of zero does not like each other. It's structurally balanced. And so it makes this intriguing connection between structural balance and essentially one dimensional representations of people's feelings about each other, right? It basically says this system, because if you think about it, a matrix of xij's which it has this product form is a rank one matrix. And indeed we can actually work out what these numbers are based on computing an eigenvector of the initial conditions. So it sort of says that the system is essentially taking all the inconsistency in the original data and squashing it into the best one dimensional approximation of it over time. Yeah. Normalization means I'm going to take this matrix xij's and make the f matrix norm, say the Frobenius norm, one at all times. Right. So uh, essentially, without that, the system actually blows up in finite time. But we only care about the signs, and so I'm going to normalize, and then so that the matrix norm is one. Yeah. The order matters. The speed at which uh, nodes are acting matters. Right. The, the final scale. Yes. So here, nodes are all acting at the same speed. Yeah. If they didn't, you'd have other kind of matrix multipliers in here, which for a reasonable version of that, you, you can still handle. And it, it, it does affect the outcome. If you and I are updating rapidly compared to everyone else, then our local consistency matters more than other people's. So it, because essentially if you put in those multipliers, then when you compute these numbers which arise from an eigenvector, you're, it's, a diff it's an eigenvector of a different matrix. So yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Um, for generic initial conditions, yeah. Well, and actually generic here also means you don't have a repeated first eigenvalue. So there are a bunch of technical conditions. Right, so with probably zero, you have a repeated first eigenvalue, and then it depends on initial condition. Oh, yeah. Would this dynamics be a stochastic dynamic where the node randomly picks um, from a distribution based on how many of the yes. um, triangles? Has anybody looked at that? Yeah, so Anton Fisky and Retner had some results on uh, discrete dynamics with stochastic. There's still local minima, and now you're relying on some kind of Metropolis Hastings thing to get you out of the local minima. And so, yes, so in, in, in the long run limit, for the reason that Metropolis finds ground states, that'll find ground states. But they show that, for example, for a large set of parameters, it's going to take exponential time to get there. Yeah. yeah, all good questions. Other questions about that? Okay, so these are examples of the kinds of ways you can reason about structural signatures that things leave on the network. Let me now think about, okay, so this, this has been a theory of balance. Let's ask what kind of signature does balance leave on networks, right? Um, and before we do that, it's useful to have a, a competing theory of what we might see when we go to look at real networks. Right? So we're going to move away from complete graphs, right? It was sort of nice to be able to talk about complete graphs, but of course the real network data we're going to look at is a gigantic sprawling graph where there are lots of triangles, but it certainly is not a complete graph. Okay, so in order to do that, let's set up an alternative to the theory of balance, and we'll call this the theory of status. And it begins from a completely different interpretation of what positive and negative evaluations might mean. Okay? So if you think about online data, 
Links are actually directed generally when we do evaluations. I express my opinion about you, right? What you think about me is, you know, that's a separate opinion. But I express what I think about you. A being positive to B could mean you're my friend, but it could also be an expression of status or of deference or of relative standing in the community, right? So maybe A is positive to B means A looks up to B, right? So when I evaluate you positively, it's because I think, you know, I think you're impressive and I'm looking up to you. And a negative means maybe you're not my enemy, but I look down on you. I think you're a lower status than I am. Okay? And then we can apply this logic sort of transitively over multi-step paths. Now, clearly, status and balance make quite different predictions. And the simplest way to say that is, suppose A is negative to B and B is negative to C. Let's look over a multi-step path. How should we believe A is going to feel about C? Well, status says, you know, well, balance in the previous slide says, a is enemies with B, B is enemies with C, enemy of my enemy is my friend, maybe we should expect that A and C are friends. Status says A looks down on B, B looks down on C, A looks even more down on C. Right? Different predictions, you know, in fact, completely different sign predictions, both from reasonable theories. And so it doesn't say one is wrong or right. It says that the signature the thing leaves in the network is going to tell us something about whether people in aggregate are using it more like balance or more like status. Right? And on many triangles, they disagree, and each of them leaves some kind of structural signature that we can look at. Okay. Good. So, right, so in some sense, status is a theory of acyclic networks. It says that if I think about flipping the minuses to be pluses in the other direction, which for status is the same thing, then I should see an approximately acyclic network if I believe in status. Balance is somehow a theory of approximately bipartite networks, right? It says that if I look at all the minus edges, I should, not s I should see sort of two camps. Okay. All right. So now we can actually go look at uh, consequences of these two theories. And actually, this is uh, some work that uh, Yuri and I have been doing jointly with Dan Huttenlocker. Um, so we're going to take data sets where people are really expressing opinions on other people. Right? There's other people content, but there's also just expressing other people. And I talked about a bunch of these. Right? So opinions, which works on a trust system. Um, I trust or distrust a user. Wikipedia, that was the Wikipedia tenure and promotion case where you express what you think about people. Um, and uh, Slash dot, where in the spirit of slash dot's bruising terminology, you can be either a friend or a foe of somebody. All right. And what we find in all three of these is actually an aggregate tendency toward status. Okay? And without walking through all, all the details, there are many, many patterns that triangles can have. But essentially across the board, we see this tendency toward balance-based reasoning in aggregate. Right? So for example, I already talked about this one. A is negative toward X. X is negative to B. And indeed, there's a tendency, right? there's a bias compared to sort of just chance prediction of A being more negative toward B. Even more surprisingly, perhaps, when B is positive to X and X is positive to A, well, friend of friend, a might, when A says what they think about B, maybe they should be friends. But status would say B looks up to X and X looks up to A, so A is really pretty high status, and we should see a tendency to look down on B. And that's indeed what we see in these data sets. Okay. So, right, so across all these data sets, we say that, now, this is not to say, and actually I've had interesting discussions with people who in fact, including one at uh, an alumni event last night from someone who's doing the biology of status, in including not just in humans, but in animals. And noting that often actions get made based on status, even though if you ask people why are you behaving this way, they, they don't say it's because of status. Right? Status is often a thing that we sort of internalize and don't actually verbalize. And so in some sense, what we're doing is extracting an aggregate pattern of behavior. Even if we ask the people why did you make that link, they might not say status. Right? Nor is it clear they're thinking status, right? It just says the system is behaving in aggregate as though status is the reason. I should also mention that it's quite complicated. Different things are happening in different parts of the network, and arguably different theories are appropriate there. So for example, in all these systems, most of the links are not reciprocated. I only know what A thought of B, I don't know what B thought of A. If I look at the subgraph where things are reciprocated, which is really a different kind of interaction, it's a case of sort of mutual understanding of people, actually balance becomes much, much more relevant, right? So, it creates interesting ideas where different subgraphs in the network are operating under different things and we're observing a superposition. And I think if we go back to the design question here, it also tells us that you know, we've taken people's multidimensional reasoning about things. People are thinking about status, they're thinking about balance, and then we ask them to press a button. right? And we lose all that reasoning, it gets collapsed into this single evaluation. And so being able to open that up, and right, there's not really a prescription here so much as a, a thing to think about, Right, being able to allow people to express the difference between I agree with you and I respect you, for example, can potentially help us separate out things that have become bundled together and in confusing ways in a lot of these contexts. OK, um, a bunch of other things. One can actually do some trying to learn of things. I, I won't say much about this, but 
in the end, what are balance and status? They're simply theories of how we should predict a link sign based on how we feel about third parties. And ultimately, what balance and status are are simply, you know, people thought hard about their human intuitions and said, okay, here's what I think is going on. Ultimately, we could try to actually learn what to do, right? So we could say, you and me, our relations to third parties can be summed up by, you know, how we feel about people when I link positively to them and they link positively to you, or I link, you know, negatively to them and they link negatively to you, and so forth. Right? Combinatorially, there are sort of 16 relations we can have to third parties. Each of us has two directions, and each of us has two signs, two to the fourth. Right? So there's sort of 16 facts we know. And actually, if you learn theories based on that, you can actually get much higher accuracy than if you simply hard code in balance or status. Right? It says that each of balance and status is some kind of a four-dimensional projection of some kind of more complicated thing that's really possibly higher, lives in higher dimensions. And finally, you can actually discover interesting subtleties in how users are evaluating each other. Okay? Stuff that we actually are only in the process now of understanding. Some of it actually in joint work that Yuri and I are doing with Dan Hottenlocker and Ashton Anderson. Um, here's just one example of something that sort of clearly cries out for explanation. So let's go back to voting on Wikipedia. Right? You come up for promotion, you have your Wikipedia CV, the community evaluates it, they vote publicly, positively or negatively. And if we believe in status, then we could look at attributes of the voter and attributes of the candidate and say, so are people of higher status, how do they feel about people of lower status? And when people are you know, low status voters, how do they feel about high status candidates? So what we propose to do is take a measure of achievement in Wikipedia and put it on the x-axis. Right? So here's what this plot is saying. On the x-axis, we're going to put the difference in the number of edits lifetime on Wikipedia that a voter has compared to a candidate when they go vote on them. Okay? Over here is voters who are higher achievement level than candidates. Over here is candidates who are higher achievement level than voters. It's just their difference in how much they've done on Wikipedia. Okay? This is with edit count. This is with a different thing, which is barn stars. For those of you who are into Wikipedia, you may know what barn stars are. Actually, some of you may even have barn stars. And what they are is these Wikipedia awards of merit that you receive from the community. Okay? So it's, again, a measure of achievement. And so we thought, OK, if you believe in the status-based reasoning, we should see these curves go down. Because when the voter looks up to the candidate, when we're over here, high, positive, high probability of positive vote. And when the voter is much higher than the candidate, we should see it lower. Okay. And indeed, these curves go from high to low, which was, which was nice. Now, often, you know, this was stuff that uh, Yuri and Dan and I were doing. Often when we do these things, we're sort of a little slow on the uptake at first. And so, you know, probably for the first month, we, all we noticed was that the thing went down and we, you know, kind of thought, it's good, you know, we expect to see that. And it, it took us a while to notice the much more interesting part of this plot, which is this is local min here. And it's really quite significant. And there's a local, corresponding local min if we take a completely orthogonal measure of achievement. Right? It's not clear what this means, but let's at least interpret it literally, syntactically from the numbers. It says, people are especially harsh on others whose achievement level is the same as their own. Right? <laughs> That's what this is saying. Right at zero, we're getting this dip. And then there's this sort of rebound. All right, eventually, the overall trend might take over. But we're getting this, this local min. Why is this happening is actually complicated. Um, and again, there's sort of ongoing work to figure this out. And it's likely, arguably, a combination of a number of things, including right, the effect of sort of new arrivals into the system, the fact that some people are more similar or less similar to others, and the fact that who comes to vote on you actually is determined by your achievement as a candidate anyway. And all these factors seem to sort of add up to what's, in fact, possibly quite a complicated phenomenon that has to be explained, but one that arguably is, again, kind of recognizable. OK, so there are a lot of interesting things going on with evaluation. Um, and with that in mind, I actually wanted to um, spend a while in the rest of the talk sort of stepping back to the offline world and talking about something I've been thinking about there, which is, again, about status, relative achievement, and all these things, and the effect kind of effects it can have in offline communities. OK, um, so I'm going to jump over that one other one other day I said, and talk about, okay, so I've been drawing all these analogies to the world of science because it's the world I live in. Um, but it's, there's actually been a lot of research and discussion on how does evaluation work in scientific communities and why does it work that way, okay? So let me start with just a few points about evaluation, right? So we talked about you and your Wikipedia CV. It's not something we really relate to because most of us aren't aspiring to come up to become admins on Wikipedia, with apologies to those of you who already are admins on Wikipedia. But you know, a lot of us think about the academic world and the scientific world. And clearly, there's a lot of things where evaluation goes on, right? Did your paper get accepted? Did your grant proposal get funded? Who got hired? Who received awards? And so forth. All of these are explicit markers of evaluation, communities expressing approval or disapproval of things. And what's interesting when you go to study this is, sure, there's a lot of randomness and decentralization, but this is actually a remarkably planned economy. 
right? If I compare this to how things work, say, in real life, you know, the broader world outside of academia, you know, we actually have committees who all get together and say, let's all agree on what we think of, you know, the, the work for the past six months or 12 months, right? Let's all make a consensus decision as to what we think is the good work. Funding agencies do the same thing, right? They get together and say, let's decide what we're going to fund. And more than that, let's decide what call proposals, let's decide what kind of work we're going to promote. And even communities get together and they right, overtly, in this kind of meta way, articulate what they think is important. Right? So when I talk about how evaluation gets decided and you think, but isn't this all organic and random? Let's think for a second because there is actually quite a bit of centralization in this process. It's designed to have that kind of centralization. Okay, so I, I guess I started thinking about this for two reasons. Um, one was this kind of work we've been doing on how evaluation works, how it looks in the online domain, and just the fact that inevitably you're led to think about these questions in the offline domain. And the second reason was because of a statement uh, three years ago that I was, um, was circulated around and people asked what I wanted to sign. Um, for those of you in the theory community, you'll recognize this. This was from Scott Aronson's blog. Uh, for those of the rest of you, I'll just kind of summarize. So th this was by actually a very impressive set of theoretical computer scientists, including, you know, Turing Award winners and so forth. And it was making a very thought-provoking point, which was they were expressing concern that CS theory conferences had begun to value difficult, to paraphrase them, difficult technical papers instead of sort of important conceptual work. And important conceptual work they felt was getting sort of neglected because program committees were valuing really hard technical papers. And as a result, people were trying to do those to get into the conferences and not doing this important conceptual work that was being left by the wayside. Right? So that was sort of their, their problem, right? Assigning little weight to conceptual considerations while assigning dominant weight to technical considerations. This is not just the theory community. I mean, you can recognize this. I mean, any of us who's had a paper rejected and if you sort of think about your monologue for the next 10 minutes, it, you know, not so different. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So, I thought about this and, you know, this question of, you know, who's going to sign on to this? And I, I gave this answer at the time that I need to think more about this, right? And it, which was not meant to be a cop-out. I really felt I needed to think more about this because it seemed like it, this is bad, but I couldn't tell. Is this really about just human foibles and what happens? Or is there something more in systemic? Like, is this sort of an inevitable consequence of the way science gets evaluated? And I, I couldn't really tell, right? It's something I had to think about it. And it took me a while to figure this out. And so Seagal, my student Seagal or Ren and I thought, actually thought about this a little bit and said, well, could we build a model of how scientific credit works and try to tease apart whether I is this just human foibles or is this something deeper? Okay. So of course it turned out that we were tapping into a large literature on how science gets evaluated involving work by a number of Nobel laureates and others. Um, and if you look at that, there are sort of two kinds of pathologies people talk about in the evaluation of scientific work. Okay? Right? If you view that science consists of people working on problems, then there's a pathology on the problem side and there's a pathology on the people side. On the problem side, it's the one that was so, you know, elegantly articulated by, uh, in this thought-provoking statement. Um, somehow, progress on certain questions is very rewarded, even when the community actually explicitly agrees that other questions are equally important. How can this happen? We all agree something else is equally important, and yet progress in certain things gets rewarded. And it often does seem to be wrapped up with the technical difficulty. On the people side, there's this other pathology, which is actually the more famous one. Uh, it's Robert Merton's Matthew effect, which he articulated in 1968, that when there's an independent or joint discovery, and there's many examples of this through history, the person who's already more, the more famous at the time of the discovery gets more of the credit for it. So two people do something, and the one who's already more famous, it gets called their discovery, it gets called their, you know, and the other person sort of gets, and that's true whether they co-authored or whether it was sort of independent discoveries. Okay. This was instantly called the Matthew effect because in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 25, verse 29, there's this line that says, um, paraphrased again, they that already have shall get more, and they that don't have will actually lose what they already have. Okay. <laughs> the book of Matthew. And hence it was called the Matthew effect. <laughs> okay. So that was the question. Is this just about human biases or is there something else going on? Okay. So there was more to this literature, right? You dig into this and actually, you know, a bunch of strands of literature asked, well, why give out scientific credit in the first place? Right? So, well, an argument that's been made by a bunch of different communities actually is that what credit is doing, obviously, is creating incentives for people to divide themselves out over different research problems. We shouldn't all work on the same thing. We should instead split up and scientific credit is going to help us do that, okay? And again, this goes under, you know, work in the philosophy of science by really science and technology studies people, economic study uh, of science, going back to the 1800s, work that Ken Arrow did in the 60s, uh, 
Pierre Bourdieu, one of the coiners of the term social capital, weighed in on this issue. Um, Eric Maskin and others. Okay, there's the Matthew effect. It's actually Dusgupta and Maskin, but Eric Maskin was the Nobel laureate, so I said Maskin and others. Okay, <laughs> so one of the nicest ways sort of this was articulated was Pierre Bourdieu. Um, and uh, I won't read this whole thing, but basically he, he, he lays this out very nicely. He says, well, researchers' motivations are organized by their anticipation of profit, credit, um, and that caused people to concentrate on the most important ones, but that creates this intense competition, right? You think of this sort of, it's sort of almost a visual image. There's this flashpoint, right? We're all working on this. We can't all work on it. What's the chance I'm going to be the one to solve it? So we go and a fraction of the researchers depart toward other objects which are less prestigious, but around which the competition is less intense, that they offer profit of at least as great, right? A kind of, you know, for someone who is a philosopher who writes about social capital, a remarkably sort of apt description of load shedding in a distributed system, right? There's a hot spot and people are just kind of moving off to other things where they, you know. Okay, so we started with a model, um, and this is a model we have in a paper coming out this spring at Stock. Um, and we actually began by adapting one of the uh, models proposed by Philip Kitcher from the Philosophy of Science. His model was sort of complicated, uh, involved things about sort of Bayesian inference from experimental data. Like there was a lot of bells and whistles, and we want something much simpler where we could see what was going on. So we thought about our own field where people just work on open problems and hope to solve them. You know, okay, that's a caricature, but you know, they're, imagine in this very simplified world, there are, there are researchers and there are projects. And the projects are kind of like, it's just an open math problem. And you, okay, and so I'm trying for something as simple as possible, right? Because I, I feel like if, if an effect like this happens in the simplest possible model, then it was not human foibles, it was something more fundamental. So there are people here, and the projects are here on the right. Each project J, here they're X, Y, and Z, has an importance, which I'll call its weight, WJ. And a difficulty, FJ, which stands for you're, you're probably failing at it, okay? So if you work on it, you might fail. Uh, but it has some importance if you succeed. Okay, and K sub J is just going to be an annotation for the number of players who choose to work on project J. So KX is two, KY is one, KZ is one. Okay, now what is the scientific community trying to do anyway? It's trying to maximize its expected benefit to society, which is the expected importance of all the research that it actually succeeds in accomplishing. Again, very simple model, right? Lots of things simple about it. We all agree, everyone in the community agrees on what the importance is. There's a fixed known difficulty. Because again, we want to see if the effect shows up even here, right? <coughs> okay, so that's just the sum of all projects of their importance times the probability gets solved, which is someone has to not fail on it, right? Okay. Um, what's the expected benefit to a person, right? So I'll think of this in a game theoretic model quickly. So we'll say the researchers are like the players in this game. So that's, well, if you chose to work on project J, this is the expected payoff to someone from that project. And by symmetry, that credit's going to go to someone, might be you. And so it's that over K sub J. I mean, you might or might not solve it, but if we take symmetry over the whole thing, that is, you know, the chance it gets solved, and that's you out of all of you. Okay, so people are going to choose what to work on. And if we take the Pierre Bourdieu load shedding thing, you expect the system might live in a Nash equilibrium. That we look around at our chance of getting the credit for what we're working on, and if there was some other thing we could go where our chance of getting the, our expected payoff was higher, we'd go move there. So Nash Equilibrium says no player has an incentive to change projects. Okay, so let's look at a simple example. And I want to sort of, I'm not, there are theorems that I'll state, but I, I can show you what's going on with small examples, and so that'll give you, you, you can generalize from the small examples. Okay, here's a simple example. There's the more important project and the less important project. Right? This has weight one, this has weight nine tenths. I make up these numbers so things work out. Right? This is the harder project. It, you pr fail probably two thirds. You hear you only fail probably one half. Right? So an important one that's easier, a less important one that's harder. Okay, on the left we have the unique Nash equilibrium. Both players are working on the easier, more important problem and they have no incentive to switch because currently they stand to share the three quarters payoff and get three eighths. And if someone goes over here, they only get one third. Right, uh, one third, three tenths, some calculation here. We can figure this out later. Okay, that might actually be three tenths. Anyway, okay, um, over here is the social optimum in which the players actually break symmetry and divide up. Right? That's tricky for them to do because they're identical players and they both want to work on this in equilibrium. But the social optimum, they'd work separately and they would actually get a social welfare of four fifths because there's a half from here and three tenths from there uh, instead, of, which is better than three quarters. Okay. So this is just a story that we've seen in many game theoretic contexts where Nash equilibria are not social socially optimal. Right? It says, okay, you know, we've seen that before. But let's ask, okay, suppose you were in charge of the world. What would you do to fix this situation? Right? 
And again, we're harking back to this idea that science, to some extent, is a planned economy. If you think the wrong problems are getting solved, then you should have the program committee accept different things, right? You, you create the incentives. This is the genuine importance, right? In our simple model, the community agrees on the importance of problems. But that doesn't mean that has to be the amount of credit you get. Importance and credit are different things, as we've seen articulated before. So one thing you could do is actually declare that the credit for Project Y is going to be higher. It's not going to be 9 tenths. It's going to be some number. And in fact, we need a bigger number. We need a number bigger than 1, like 9 8, bigger than 9 8s, in fact. And then actually the unique Nash equilibrium becomes socially optimal. Okay? So remember, the social welfare still uses the real importances that we all agreed on. We've just decoupled the credit and the importance, and that was actually necessary to achieve social optimality. Right? To get maximum productivity in the community, we had to intentionally misreward people for what they were doing. Or to put it another way, suppose this is the theory community competing at NSF with you know, AI and systems and so forth for funding. They have to maximize their external output to impress the outside world. And they and the outside world agree on what the real importances are. And that says if you want to maximize your chances when you fight with the outside world by maximizing your external thing, you have to create a fake currency system inside that doesn't reflect the true importance of the problems for the sake of the external. Right? That's what they're saying. That's on the project side, right? The player side was the Matthew effect. And you could actually do something there too. Okay? What you could do there is say, all right, A and B were identical, but I'm going to break symmetry between them. I'm going to decide that A, because they graduated from a more prestigious school, actually is going to get more of the credit if they happen to jointly discover something. Okay? So if both players succeed on the same project, then person A receives credit with probably C over C plus 1, for some number C bigger than 1. Okay? And it turns out for C large enough, uh, there's now, we now get social optimality as a Nash equilibrium. B, who's been marginalized, decides it's no longer worth it to go to this other problem because they're not going to get the credit anyway. A is going to get it. So they end up on Y. And so there's a kind of Matthew effect going on. Now, since our model is intentionally so simple, we didn't build fame into it. So we're not distinguishing on fame, right? We're distinguishing on an arbitrary symmetry breaking here. Yes? So you're saying, balancing is the right outcome. I mean, that would be like saying, well, uh, go to the least attended session in the conference and choose the best way. Um, but that's actually not true. Right? If I made the importance low enough, then social optimality says everyone should work on the important problem. Right? So this is not as simple as we should all split up. This is really, we should split up optimally, and optimally is not what the next right? Yeah, so it is not all balancing we want. What we want is the optimal allocation of effort, and that involves more people working on the important problems, right? The simple example obviously doesn't have enough resolution to show that. But you want an optimal skew, and that's not what you're getting. But yeah, we could talk about this afterwards. But yeah, it's not as simple as load balancing. This is actually a more subtle optimization problem. So the theorem actually is that this is a general phenomenon. We, we, we saw the bad examples of what we do on that example. But in fact, for any set of players and projects, this optimization problem of allocate, optimize the community's effort, can be achieved by a reweighting of the projects. There's always a reweighting of the projects such that all Nash equilibria are in fact socially optimal. Right? And it's one that rigs the credit appropriately. And on the player side, there always exists a reweighting of the players. There exists a Matthew effect that creates social optimality. Okay? And actually, there are a bunch of extensions of the theorem that I'm not going to go into, but essentially, uh, it also extends to players of heterogeneous abilities. So imagine that these players are not identical, but Player I has a sort of skill at solving problems, P sub I, and their chance of succeeding depends on that. There, too, these theorems carry over, right? You need different amounts of credit, and you need a different Matthew effect, but you can still achieve social optimality. And we also have results on how bad are things if, if you don't do reweighting. Um, I'm not going to walk through. The, the proofs of these actually end up becoming somewhat technical, especially once you get here. With identical players, you can sort of see what's going on. Th this one leads to some rather complicated optimization functions that are hard to reason about. But I, I can give you sort of a sort of one slide intuition for how the proofs work. And the way the proofs work is to actually think about this, we've been talking about load balancing, as a kind of routing problem. So really the selection of projects is a, a congestion game known from the game theory literature uh, for a while and made famous in computer science by the work of Tim and Ava. And I can interpret, first of all, this problem as a congestion game. Everyone's trying to choose a project. So if I imagine there's a destination node over here, they're all trying to choose a route through the system to the destination. Okay. And under sort of a suitable interpretation of payoffs, um, right, I mean, it's not going to be congestion in the sense of congestion's bad. It's going to be, a, a, you know, we're just going to use that to measure the value to society. Uh, and we can do that appropriately. Um, that lets us think about equilibria. And then reweighting of projects is a kind of bizarre notion of putting a toll on the system, right? So when a congestion game doesn't turn out right, uh, on highways, I put tolls, and I can sometimes get the traffic turnout correctly. And so this reweighting of projects, this assigning of the wrong importance of things, is kind of like putting a toll 
to sort of correctly balance out the load. The analogy isn't perfect because we can't just take results on tolls and apply them here, especially when we have players of different abilities because now the toll operates differently on different people. It gets complicated, but that's the intuition of what's going on. And similarly, the Matthew effect sort of turns it into a kind of Stackelberg game, for those of you who know that term, in which I allow the players to move in order. And so a player going later is somehow factoring in the fact that they're less likely to get the credit from people who moved earlier. And it's not quite early late because there's weights, but that's some of the intuition for what's going on. Right, so the Matthew effect is kind of like helping order players and this assigning the wrong importance to technically hard problems is like somehow charging a toll on the other ones. Okay? That's all I'm going to say about the proof. I actually want to wrap up with just a couple slides. First, let me just wrap up on this particular thing and then wrap up more generally. So this has been a very, very simple model. I mean, we can make it a little more general with skills and so forth, but in the end it's general. So it's fair to ask, you know, do we really learn something in this model, you know, qualitatively? And I, I feel like personally I actually learned things that I hadn't really articulated myself before, right? Somehow the reweighting of projects gets back to this load balancing point, right? Pierre Bourdieu was right. It's like a load balancing problem. But, and it, that actually does get people to spread out. It really does. And it sometimes can actually achieve optimality. But somehow the spreading out effect doesn't work strongly enough. It's like you have this weakened spreading out force and it needs help. It needs you to amp it up a little bit by rigging the credit on things, right? That's really what's going on, right? The, the invisible hand sort of works, just not enough. Yeah? What does that mean by you have an intuitive interpretation of reweighting? Is it increasing the rates of... Uh, I mean, intuitively... So it's sort of like increasing the weight of the hard problems that people don't want to work on, but it's more like saying, let's figure out at optimality what we would have, I mean, as with tolls, and let's figure out how do I create now an expected payoff so that people are completely indifferent over what they select. That's the intuition. Reweighting of players I find even sort of more intriguing, and it tells me a punchline that I don't, I mean, I'm not approving of this punchline, I'm not saying this is a good idea, but it's what it's saying, right? That it says sometimes when a community marginalizes certain people, it tells them, sorry, you're going to lose it forces them to embark on strategies that actually perversely kind of raise social welfare. It forces them to engage in high-risk, innovative things that they were forced to do because you treated them unfairly. Right? It's not saying this is what you should do, but it's saying this is what sometimes maybe happens. Yeah. So the matching effect was stronger, right? It said that not only are you re-weighting, but you're always re <laughs> in favor of people who are more famous. Yeah, so okay. Because you get famous somehow correlated to skill. With skill then yeah, do I get that? So this is a very interesting question, right? So we have this model with skills. And so does it actually weight according to skill? For, if you create special cases, you, you can say that does happen. Um, in particular, if the optimum is, is, a, is a matching, basically, then yes, it's roughly doing that. The problem is that the objective function here, once you have skills, is NP-hard. And so, in a sense, nothing as simple as just reweighting by skill is going to really work because that's somehow we would, yeah, the NP-hard is good. So you have these pathological examples where it can work out. Have you tried layering the balance or status models on top of this because uh, when I choose projects, it sometimes has to do with who my friends are and who's my enemies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, let me come down to Because actually there's a bunch of generalizations of, of which that feeds into, into some of these. Um, I want to make one more point actually, which is, there's a third thing I, I kind of learned from this, which is, it explains something that I learned from Ron Burt, uh, the famous sociologist at the University of Chicago, sitting in his office in Chicago, where he said to me, you know, Crowded research community, right, sparse research communities differentiate themselves horizontally. You differentiate yourself by what you're working on, and you know, it's sort of share and share alike. Crowded research communities differentiate themselves vertically by these sort of arcane status hierarchies that only they understand, right? And you actually see something like that here, which is take the same set of projects, but now increase the number of players. And what happens is that creates a more crowded community. And in fact, the reweighting changes so that it pushes more and more into hard problems, right? So it says, in some precise sense, crowded communities are more obsessed with hard problems. Not arbitrarily. There can be some problems that even they view as too hard, and they downweight. But they're going to push things toward more toward hard problems. Okay, yeah. So lots of open questions. One is, of course, we don't all have a uniform skill. Some of us are better at some things, some of us at others. So you could say actually, player has a probably PIJ of succeeding on project J. Right? There's already differentiation built into this, where you know maybe we spread out. That of course helps people spread out. I have my specialty. You have your specialty. Um, here actually, re reweighting projects doesn't always achieve social optimality. It's a nice question: How well can you do by reweighting projects or players, for that matter? Um, other things is the issue of sort of what our friends are working on, what our rivals are working on. For that matter, there's a whole issue of collaboration, right? This doesn't model collaboration. It doesn't matter, model how you multiplex your effort across multiple projects. It doesn't model how there's dependence among projects, right? Maybe, and so there's another thing, of course, that people talk about as a pathology in credit, which you could potentially try to model, which is the tendency of the final step in the solution of something to get the credit and not the more important step that actually laid the groundwork. But you need a partial order on projects for that to even show up. And arguably, 
believably would if you had a if you had a model of that, which is also intriguing. And of course, finally, you know, this is a very simple model where we all know what the importance is, we all know what the hardness is. Um, limited information and dynamic arrival of projects again could potentially model things such as research fads, because arguably a research fad in a model like this is that a problem arrives, you don't know how hard it is. So there, if it looks important, there's an explore exploit trade-off where we start all working on it because in case it's easy, we should work on it. Uh, and then we, we stop because we decide it's hard. Right? And so you could potentially actually see fad cycles from dynamic models. So it seems to be sort of a base on which you can layer on a bunch of things. But even this very simple model, I feel like, as I said, tells me things I didn't, I maybe intuitively believe, but hadn't somehow articulated. OK, so with that, let me wrap up. And this has all been part of this general challenge of many, many situations, offline, online. You see opinions being expressed, evaluations being formed. and Yet often you don't actually know what are the underlying mechanisms driving that. All, all you see is the outcome. You see the opinion or the evaluation, but you don't know what the actual interpretation of that was. And so a lot of these models, I would argue, are what they're doing is providing us a vocabulary for being able to talk about these, being able to talk about is it this or is it that. In order to even ask the question, we need some kind of model for what signatures those leave on the network. And again, this design consideration that in online domains, arguably, the sort of interfaces we provide have collapsed several dimensions of evaluation into one in ways that are now very, very hard to disentangle when we go to interpret what people are saying. So I think there's a bunch of opportunities here, both to think about models of these forces at work, to think about how they work in, the, in, in online applications, and to think about potentially informing going forward the design of new applications. Thanks very much. I guess a couple of questions. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, can the structure of the theory be used as a couched as a political game? Uh, stick to a statement about all those things? Good question. So the question is, right, could, could structural balance be thought of as a coalitional game? And now the core, the, the split is like, that's a, a core solution to it. Good question. Um, we've thought a little bit about, you know, that what we should, that you, that, that you ought to say somehow that when there's tension among your friends, that creates a negative payoff, or that's kind of a negative weight. And now we're trying to split so as to limit, push out all that negative payoff, which is what a core solution would do. It's an intriguing question. We've thought about it as far as the level of let's write down payoffs, but it, yeah, nice question. Not, not, not clear whether you could carry it all the way to that. Uh, if you had a whole bunch of people uh, things you could click on, like, dislike, agree, disagree, look up to, look down to. So we're all obviously available on every question. Right. And so here I, you know, you're welcome to beat up on me if you, you know, uh, feel like you know more about this than I do. But my sense from all this is that obviously too many dimensions is bewildering. And then we know people are just not going to tell you anything. Um, we do feel like, you know, the two that consistently emerge are, you know, agree versus respect, right? As in, it's possible for me to disagree with you, but to think you're a reasonable member of the community. It's possible for me to agree with you, but not like how you said something. These are really decoupled. Um, to the extent I can sort of sneak those in, and maybe the buttons don't say agree and respect, but maybe they, you know, to the extent I can tease that out of evaluations you did. And maybe, you know, one comes out of one kind of evaluation, one comes out of another kind. Maybe what I'm doing is seeing when do you agree with the people you already declared as friends, and when do you, you know, there are many ways to try inferring that. But I think, yeah, offering something that lets me see those two dimensions would certainly I think help disentangle this and also help us understand is this really what's going on or are there third and fourth dimensions that we're not appreciating? But there, 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 are, uh, there are currently many ways, right? So maybe you could mind emoticons. So there's these things called emoticons where you, there's a different one for each thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. So right, if you, if you, if you I'm not asking the question of whether you could analyze it better if you had all those things, but what would, what would that change? How would that change the dynamics of the online social control? Right. Well, so I mean, if you think about sort of how community discussion works, right? It gets polluted by, you know, conflict and acrimony and so forth. And potentially, if you could sort of, right, the, the, the question is how online do you have a discussion where people are disagreeing and they're still somehow in a way that the people with high quality content are still being promoted, right? Because somehow there's a selection bias where acrimony tends to spiral and attract lower quality content. Potentially, this is a way to do that, right? Because if we're keeping track of agree, disagree versus the respect, not respect, right? Then people who are still garnering respect for their comments, if we're pulling things in from both sides, it may look different. Again, this is speculation and by someone who, you know, has built fewer interfaces than many of you in the audience. Yeah, Leo. Does the theory suggest how to, how to choose the person that you might call the Kleinberg goat, that is the guy that will be marginalized for the maximum potential benefit? 
So, I mean, in principle, this does say that, you know, here is the set of weights such that the equilibrium will be socially optimal. And then someone out of that ends up getting very low weight. And as I, as I was saying to, to Ashish, in some special cases, it's really a skill ordering. And it really feels like it's the Matthew effect. The good people, and it, it, it makes sense. So for those of you who want to sort of do the math in real time, if I'm trying to maximize a kind of product of importance times chance it succeeds, I need to put, you know, I maximize that quadratic objective by putting the good people in the important projects and the weak people in the bad projects. That's what the Matthew effect's doing. It's saying, I need to promise in advance, we need to all have an understanding in advance that the good researcher will get the credit if they succeed. And that's going to cause them to feel safe working on the important problem, even if it's going to be com they're going to be competed with, because they know they'll get the credit. And for social optimality, that quadratic objective is actually maximized. That way. Again, very simple model, but that's arguably what's behind this thing. On the other hand, if we have a more complicated situation where it's not just a, a simple matching, then you have these complicated instances because it's an NP hard problem. And there you can see things where, because you know it's this low balancing problem where four people should go here and eight people should go there, someone loses just because of some knapsack-like problem where they were the person left over. In the, so yeah. So in special cases, you can see what's going on. It looks like the Matthew effect. Other cases, it looks like just some NP hard knapsack problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are there uh, social theories, going back to the previous work you were talking about in terms of the, uh, the status versus the balance theory, um, are, there, uh, <coughs> are there theories as to what the initial conditions might be or external conditions might be that determine whether or not you're going to see a balance theory or the balance theory? Good question. There seems to be relatively limited. I mean, there are some theories that suggest that, you know, among people you know well, you care about maintaining balance or feel more distant, you care about status, right? This idea that you use your weak ties. So Ron Burt has advocated this theory that one thing that weak ties do, right, people you don't know very well, is you use them as points of comparison. You say, you know, is my salary as good as theirs? Do I drive as nice a car as they do or whatever it is you care about? And that's the weak ties. Whereas strong ties, you're more concerned with maintaining consistency in your relationships because you live with these people on a daily basis. And that would argue that you see sort of balance happening locally and status happening long range. But it's tricky, right? Because each of us has a different set of strong ties on which we apply balance, right? So the set of people to which I'm applying balance is not the set of people to which you're applying balance. And that can create a complicated situation. But th those are some of the ways in which people have thought about how they might interact. But this whole question of how the two interact simultaneously, very, very good, mainly open question. One more question, sure. Um, if you allow uh, relaxation of the model, if you can let it <coughs> work on partial problems or partially work on the I guess the NP hardness goes away, right? Certainly a purely fractional reaction. Well, it's tricky because the payoff function is actually quite complicated. Um, so even though you have fractional variables, one would have to check because you're not summing a linear objective function, right? You're summing this strange exponential objective function, which is, does not behave so nicely. Um, so not clear. But some relaxations might be more tractable. Not obvious. Yep. OK. okay. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.